Hello, everyone. Welcome to the States and Nation Policy Summit. I'm Katherine Mortensen from Alec Public Affairs, and I'm so pleased today to be joined by Steve Yates. He's with the America First Policy Institute. And Steve, your specialty, your expertise is really all things China. Yeah. So I would love today just to start this interview asking you about breaking news out of China, which I think we're all aware has been these riots, the protests, uh, whatever you want to call them. People are really um, upset about the lockdowns, the continued COVID lockdowns. Tell us what's happening there. Right. Well, I think it's probably come as a surprise to people. They know that China has pretty significant government controls over all elements of life. There's massive surveillance state using technology, etc. The most extreme lockdowns on the planet have actually been in China. Uh, some of the biggest cities, including the largest city, Shanghai, was locked down for two full months. People didn't have reliable access to food, uh, were literally beaten by police to go back inside if they went out without authorization. They have to hold a smartphone or some other device up. If they enter public transportation or public buildings, it gives a red, yellow, or green signal. You get the wrong signal, you're sent away to a quarantine camp. Uh, so this is very, very extreme. This last weekend in the far west area of China where the Uyghur people live, the majority Muslim population, there were several families who were literally welded shut into their apartments under a quarantine, this COVID zero quarantine, and a fire started. And tragically and horrifically, that video went all over the news and the internet of that family being killed by a state-sponsored policy that locked them in and there was no escape. And it just set off people all across the country in ways I haven't seen since the Tiananmen Square demonstrations and massacre in 1989 with thousands and thousands and thousands of Chinese citizens hitting the streets, demanding that the government change policy, and even in some places, holding up a white sheet of paper to say they want freedom of speech and freedom of association in order to be able to address their grievances to the government. So it's quite a remarkable movement. So one question I have about what's happening in China, do the Chinese people know that the rest of the world no. has largely moved on and we're living our lives as normal again? Are they aware of that? No, the government has controlled propagation of information in their social media. Uh, they have in intense controls over the internet, which is why Apple's decision to modify the airdrop function in their operating system got in the way of dissidents and organizers of these demonstrations from being able to directly communicate. They call it the great firewall of China. So if you're actually using a cell signal line or the internet, the government can track and block. Uh, and so uh, a lot of people in China didn't really know that the rest of the world has moved on. Uh, even the World Cup, their broadcast of the World Cup had blurred out audience faces so that the Chinese public wouldn't see literally tens of thousands of people in close proximity with no masks anymore. Uh, so no, they've been, it's, it's been a parallel universe for them. Frankly, that's what the communist government has done to control dissent since the, the 1989 crackdown and, and demonstrations so that people would be disaggregated. They wouldn't realize this isn't just happening to them. It's everywhere across China. Uh, and so uh, the demonstrations flooded the streets. Today, they're a little bit more quiet because the people know the government will be coming to crack down on them. But that just is a demonstration of their courage. We saw it in Hong Kong. We're seeing it inside China now. Well, thank you for that update. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about what China is doing here in the United States um, under, I, mean, I think we've all been seeing the headlines that they're increasingly buying up our rural agricultural lands. Right. Tell us what's going on there and what implications does this have for our states and what can states do to fight back? Well, at the America First Policy Institute, we mean what we call ourselves. We want to put America first. And there's in, in many ways nothing more American than the farm life and ag land. I mean, it's one of, I think, the most important strategic resources we have. Our food supply is something that is strategically incredibly important to our people. Uh, we have just lived through a period where we know that the government of China is not about quality control or protecting human beings. I mean, they had a scandal of their own with poison being in baby formula not that long ago. And so the idea 
that government or entities that are tied to that kind of government could buy agricultural land. Number one, no one has a right to buy land in the United States if you're not an American citizen. It's a privilege. Uh, and maybe it's a privilege we want to extend to a lot of people, but not everyone. And something is different about the Communist Party of China and that government. And so we've proposed some model policy language uh, that is at a working group at ALEC this time. Uh, we're working with the Task Force on International Relations and Federalism to get broader buy-in and some feedback about whether this works in a lot of states. And hopefully by the summer meeting next year with the working group, we also addressed the rural caucus here today uh, to get a lot of other people to maybe improve upon the language that we have proposed. But the bottom line to lay down a marker that when it comes to the malign influences of the Chinese Communist Party, it ought to stop first on the ag land, maybe broader property and land and access to markets, universities and other parts of the American way of life. But it begins by accepting and respecting the principle that the communist government of China is not the friend of the Chinese people. And it's also not a cooperation partner for the American people. And we need to begin at the grassroots up to build a foundation for a different approach to China. Thank you so much, Steve. So I love your message that the states can take action to stop Absolutely. this encroachment from China and into our buying our rural agricultural lands, which really does become, as you mentioned, a national security issue. Right. Because our whole food supply, you know, is it at risk. That's right. Well, so. and you have a government that doesn't respect ethics right. or limits to science. And if they were willing to take risks that poisoned the world, right. uh, poisoned their own children at different times and has led to these extreme lockdowns and the dystopian pictures we're seeing right. now, why would we trust them to have goods, be good stewards of land, even if it's in a small amount? in the United States. All right, if you wanna learn more about what Steve Yates is doing at the America First Policy Institute, I put the name of the website up. It's just like I said, AmericaFirstPolicyInstitute.org. I can even show you their, uh, their website real quick and you can see kind of what they're doing over there. You all are covering a wide range of issues um, so you just are the guy in charge of all things China. We have 20 plus research yeah. centers and focuses. I, I am the chair of the China Policy Initiative. And if I do my job right, all of the other chairs feel very, very comfortable talking about the role China plays in each of their areas of expertise, whether it's like Hogan on election integrity or others on education and values mm -hmm. uh, and trade and other other issues. So. Well, thank you so much, Steve. So check out the America First Policy Institute. And thank you for watching here. We are at the uh, States and Nation Policy Summit in downtown Washington, D.C., and we'll see you next time on another ALEC TV broadcast. Thanks, everyone.